Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again with the audience vote of Series 9. <laughs> but I'm joined by... Yes, he's still here. The questionably quizzical, the quirky, queasy, quibblesome Ben Carter. You got way more cues than I expected. That's fantastic. And they were fairly kind. Again, depends how you look at them. I'm looking at them in a, as positive light as I can. Um, and I'll take it. Take it all the way to the market. But yeah, welcome back. The audience vote um, is one of the strangest audience votes we've done so far because we had about 13 different cases that could have won it. Uh, and eventually it came down to today's, I'm not going to say winner, today's subject matter. Uh, how are we doing? Producer Dan. Very good, thank you. Weird to be on episode 10, isn't it? It's, it's flown by. Um... Three left, two left. I can't count. But very good, thank you very much. I have to agree with Ben. This this audience vote, I could never have predicted. Um, not that some of the other ones have thrown some um, random ones into the mix before, but this one, yeah. When it came to the head versus, even when it came to the head versus head, I was banking on it being um, Rodney rather than Peter. But um, Peter has outpipped Rodney to the top, and um, yeah, here we are. Yeah, here we are indeed. And it's, yeah, I can, we have a fair few um, Scottish viewers and listeners of the podcast. And we're, we're obviously, I'm going to apologise in advance for any mispronunciations. We love Scotland. And yeah, I can completely see why this is such a poignant uh, case up in Scotland. But also, obviously, it's seeped down into a vast amount of uh, England as well. And um, yeah, spent my bank holiday weekend researching Peter Tobin. Spent Easter with Tobin, which was not on my list of things I expected to happen in 2024. Did you guys have any um, any Easter eggs over your Easter weekend? I didn't. Just a flat no. Oh, this is the Easter egg thing I got. Quite scary, really. Oh, Jesus. Did it squeak? Oh, you're eating it. It, was a, Doesn't it squeak, looked like no. a squeezy, squeaky dog's toy. So you're eating that like a sandwich. <laughs> 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 Break it apart. <laughs> Two hands. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to find you. <laughs> you were, you talk, you were <laughs> like you had to hold a two fucking crusts. <laughs> Did you bit into it like one as well, as if it wasn't going to crack? <laughs> oh, that was oh. I prefer a real egg now over a chocolate egg. Yeah. Been working out. Yeah, it's very adult. <laughs> I'm working out. I prefer eggs now. <laughs> But yes, enough about Easter eggs. I'm sure no one gives a shit. Um, this case, of course, <laughs> is the case of Peter Tobin, the beast of West Lothian, the body under the church killer, Peter Tobin and the links to Bible John. Yeah, th this this will annoy you. Obviously, with the audience vote, we had no idea what was coming. But if I had known this was coming, then my cryptic clue would have been someone's left Tyrion Lannister at the dump. Uh, Tyrion Lannister, Peter Dinklage uh, at the dump to, to bin. Peter to bin. Is that the most recognisable Peter you could think of? <laughs> I did search. I did search famous Peters and he was about seventh or eighth on the list. Fair. Which I thought was high. Mm. Um, but you can apply that to any famous Peter at the dump. Peter to bin, yeah. Dinklage has, has stubbed his foot on the um, trash can. Tobin. Um, but yeah, either, both of them are bad. So, um, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just to stress, we are focusing on Peter Tobin and, and, and the, uh, the crimes he's been proven um, to commit. But before we start, like we always do, Danny Boy, can you please set the scene? During a span of almost two decades, Peter Tobin became a human embodiment of horror and hate. With a predatory instinct and pure evil in his nature, Tobin prowled the streets of England and Scotland, preying on the innocent and vulnerable. His crimes characterised by unspeakable brutality and depravity, paint a chilling portrait of pure horror unleashed upon the country. From his early years steeped in violence and darkness to his calculated and sadistic reign as a serial killer, Tobin's legacy is one of unrelenting horror. His victims, often young women and girls, fell prey to his twisted desires, their lives extinguished in the most gruesome and merciless manner imaginable. As the authorities raced against time to stop his ever-changing reign of terror, the true extent of Tobin's depravity was laid bare, leaving a scar on society that has never fully healed. So yeah, this is of course the audience vote. Um, 
beat uh, Rodney Alcala by, a, it was about 64% to 36. Um, and they often get kind of shouts in each series vote um, to, for us to eventually cover. It's not hard to see why. What I found most shocking about this case was actually how they ended up catching him um, and the police operation that was in in motion in order to find him because he changed so much of his MO, his location, his name, his identity, his background story. Um, the way that they caught him was b bloody hats off to the cops, is what I'll say, early doors. Like where every case we seem to do, that there's a lot of people that um, lambast the police about how they, how they act. But yeah, this one is, is it's a very tricky one, especially coming from a time where DNA evidence and whatnot, and even CCTV wasn't as readily available. He's a very curious character, I have to say. One of the detectives I saw described him as handsome. I'm not sure if I'll go that far, but um, not calling him ugly, but just saying he's a uh, meh. Yeah, oh, he's, he's fairly symmetrical. Was... How, how many pints, Ben? How many pints? Uh, I don't know. In terms of our current series, I could see him and Michael Peterson getting on well. Handsome. Yeah, that's what I was saying, Dan. Ben's being too what? kind. No, if you look at sort of um, not not re very. You, if you look at him in his sort of younger-ish year. Oh God, yeah, the first picture I found <laughs> is fucking terrifying. <laughs> um, it's him. No, it's not handsome. Quite the opposite, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, but that was yeah. It's a common thing. It comes up all the way through this case. People finding him charming, handsome, well dressed. Young, younger him looks like a ventriloquist dummy. Yes, that's fair. Yes, yeah, the one that's um, from Goosebumps, perhaps. <laughs> Slappy. Pardon? I think it was called Slappy, wasn't Why it? Why do you think Michael Peterson and him would get on so well? I just feel like they have a laugh, few beers, Ooh. get on well. Fair. Just sort of... Yeah. I, was trying to, I was trying to grade, place him amongst the other males that we've covered in this series or previous series. He'd sort of be mid-table, I would say. Yeah, okay. I, I think, yeah. We're not going to... This isn't just us rating serial killers and how they look, but... Um, He's definitely charming from what we from what we gather from you know the evidence and people that have met him, but I just thought the detective saying oh, handsome was a little bit, a little bit over the top. So the the very uh, detective that uh, Tom is referencing, who actually sat down and did quite an intimate interview with Lad Bible, which I found uh, really insightful. You always emphasise the Bible, Lad Bible. Bible. Oh, do I? Oh, Lad Bible. LB. Lad Bible. Lad Bible. I didn't even, it's another thing I'm going to have a complex oh, about. Just, just speak properly. <laughs> fine. Uh, but yeah, this week we're going to start off with a quote, and this does come from the very same uh, detective or former detective that Tom referenced, which is David Swindle, who spent many years working on the Tobin case, and he said the following. I don't think he was ever capable of humanity. Tobin never wanted to reveal the true extent of his crimes. It was all about the power and control it gave him. He never cared about his victims or their families. He was a calculated murderer who ultimately only ever thought about himself, right until the very end. There is no doubt in my mind that he's responsible for many more murders, but as I feared he would, he's taken his secrets to the grave with him. Hey, that's definitely something that um, I've heard many people say, is they strongly believe Tobin has committed a lot more crimes than sadly we're able to cover with in this case. A lot of... Um, Bodies unfound, missing people who maybe never were reported. And the thing I never take away from this case is, Ben, I never thought of the locks uh, being used for such uh, criminal activities in, in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Famous beauty spots. Go and have a nice weekend there, um, but not what these lock are. To. Maybe don't dip your toe in there. Yeah, be careful. Mm. Be careful probably put yeah. me off swimming in locks for life. Go to locks for life. Um, Iggy Pop. Locks for life, yeah, okay, that works, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> he's made himself laugh there. Yeah, <laughs> it's made myself really giggly. Yeah, and also we had last week Reggie Cray on the on the deathbed uh, was quite openly sharing ad additional information that he didn't want to take to the grave with him. Um, whereas Tobin, the polar opposite, um, and that's a big element of this case. All the other, not just the Bible, John murders. There's a whole a couple dozen additional murders that kind of fit in with his time frame and locations and, and MO um, that, yeah, he was to the very end um, adamant uh, that he would not share any information. Even when he was being taken from the police station into jail, he kicked out a, a kicked out a, a journalist. He just looked and it just looked they played it in slow motion on a clip I watched and he uh, he just looked so full of venom even to his to his later days. Like football commentators say, it always looks worse in slow motion. Like, the, like this. 
Ik man. Oh, nee. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, he's done me. Classic it come up. But yeah, he, he's definitely one that would um, want to retain his power. And also, I think, would buzz off the idea of speculation about him after he's passed, about possible things he's done. Yeah. Um, and like, kind of like the kind of boogeyman. Boogeyman? I always say that. Bogeyman. Not the boogeyman. <laughs> Different guy. The bogeyman kind of persona that he has a bit around him. Yeah. Uh, so annoyingly, yeah, he would love... He'd be buzzing off the audience folk. So well done, audience. Yeah, you... Mm. Mm. But anyway, let's jump right into the life and crimes of Peter Tobin, one of Scotland's most infamous serial killers. Peter Britton Tobin was born on the 27th of August 1946 in the town of Johnston, which is just 12 miles west of Glasgow. Tobin actually shares the same town of birth as celebrity chef and cereal potty mouth Gordon Ramsay. Hi, hi, big boy. Hi. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, and actually, yeah, would have, they would have links. Well, not together, but you know, uh, Tobin would also later work in kitchens. Uh, Tobin was the youngest of eight children born to Daniel and Marjorie Tobin. And depending on which source you trust, he either had four older sisters and three older brothers or four older brothers and three old, older sisters. Um, either way, it was a pretty close split and Tobin was the last to arrive. The family of 10 were predominantly based in the Renfrew area, where Tobin's father Daniel worked as an engineer for the local council, whilst his mother, who preferred to go by Margaret rather than Marjorie, stayed at home in order to raise and look after her children. Though there isn't a great deal of information on record about Tobin's childhood, what is known is that, even from a young age, he would show very little signs of remorse or emotion whenever he got into trouble or did something wrong, with one of his older brothers, Robert, describing him as a bit wild from the moment he could walk. Like many children growing up in the late 40s and 50s, Tobin would spend a great deal of his time outdoors playing in the streets with other children in his neighbourhood, but any group that Tobin mixed with would ultimately end up causing trouble. The Glasgow area had quickly become one of the most densely populated cities in the world following on from World War II, and so it was not at all uncommon for lots of new faces and families to move into the areas surrounding it. Whilst his siblings had no problem socialising and making new friends, Tobin found it progressively more difficult, and was often teased for his small size and quick temper. It has been reported that Tobin didn't just cause problems in his neighbourhood, he also regularly acted out when he was back at home with the family. And despite being the youngest of the eight Tobin children, he would very rarely take his older siblings' advice or listen to them when they tried to settle him down. This continual acting out often resulted in Tobin being beaten by his father, his mother and even his elder siblings. By the time Tobin turned seven in 1953, his attitude and behaviours had become far too difficult for his mother to deal with. If he wasn't getting into trouble in the streets, he was causing havoc for the home, regularly breaking furniture and crockery, whilst also fighting with his siblings. There have also been some allegations that, from as early as the age of five, Tobin had kicked and thrown stones at stray cats and dogs. His neighbours complained about him, his teachers complained about him, and his siblings complained about him. So everyone, yeah. Everyone complained about him, a lot complained mm. about little Tobin. So uh, eventually Daniel and Marjorie made the decision to send him off to what was then referred to as an approved school uh, or a reform school, which was essentially a residential school for children with either emotional or behavioural difficulties or children that had been sent there via the court. Um, so it's an interesting mix. Uh, this allowed Tobin to mix with other children who were either deemed to be beyond their parents' control or had committed criminal offences. And though the school itself made a, a kind of made an effort or attempt to segregate the boys based on their age groups, there were a number of different communal areas where this could not happen. Um, and as uh, approved schools were a lot more relaxed in comparison to, say, a borstal or a uh, secure juvenile facility, there was a lot of opportunity for trouble to emerge. And with Tobin, he took full advantage of that. A regular pattern quickly emerged of Tobin getting into fights and then running away from the school. So from this point onwards, he would run to nearby towns and villages and he would just kind of walk about throughout the day. He'd have no set location um, and his, yeah, his environment would constantly be changing uh, and this would uh, become a big theme uh, in his later life. Though it was less strict than a borstal setting, there was discipline at the school and it's highly likely that Tobin was either caned or strapped on at least one occasion. That's like, is that like belted? It looked like a little bit of bunch of twigs. Nasty looking thing, strapping it's called. So if you're a strapping young man, it means something very different in, in Scotland. Very different. I had a horrible stat earlier, uh, the other day, about one in five teachers have either been hit or physically assaulted by a student when they did a recent study. One in five. 
Wow. So Tobin was either caned or strapped or even belted on at least one occasion, thus continuing his triangle of unhappiness, misbehaviour and no reaction to reprimand. During the time that he did spend at the approved school, Tobin was put through a basic education but also introduced to various work school classes, including woodwork, gardening, metalwork and even bricklaying. And it is here that he learnt some basic skills that would serve him well in later life when trying to obtain employment on numerous occasions. There's not a great deal of information that is available about Tobin's teenage years, though it is believed he returned to his family home after eventually finishing school, but very quickly placed into a young offenders institute as well as a borsal due to continued aggressive, disruptive and antisocial behaviours, as well as undisclosed petty crime. After serving these sentences, Tobin was able to work a number of cash in hand roles before eventually purchasing himself a motorbike, which he would happily ride all over the Scottish countryside up to the Highlands and down to England. On his time at the approved school, Borstal and Young Offenders Institute, forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger said the following. You're dealing and living with other criminals, and so you develop a criminal thinking pattern. He learned how to be highly manipulative, how to get over on people, and to be able to detect who is susceptible. So during this time frame, Tobin would sleep rough and occasionally stay in hostels and shelters all across the UK. He tried to befriend, uh, and this part I found quite interesting because it happens a few times in his life, he tried to befriend numerous other bikers and also biker gangs. Um, it's not fact or fiction that he tried to join biker gangs. Um, there are some suggestions that he briefly was allowed into a biker gang, but they quickly got rid of him. Um, it, it is an interesting one, but for, for whatever reason, he always seemed to remain alone. From this moment onwards, he would very rarely return to see his family, as essentially he viewed them as having abandoned him or given up on him. Um, and I did watch, actually, I'll pop it in the Facebook group, I watched an excellent BBC documentary that gave me similar vibes to the early life of Tobin, um, which is called Dead Man Running. Um, and it's about a guy called Kim the Busker in Inverness. And there are, it's a bit of a mystery, and then there's some twists and turns. I won't spoil it for anyone, um, but I'll pop it in our Facebook group because it's uh, well worth a watch, highly recommended. Pop doc in groupie. Yeah, I will pop the doc in the groupie. Right up there. <clears throat> there are once again slightly conflicting stories about what happens next in Tobin's life. As a result of his local reputation and poor attitude, he found it increasingly difficult to find and maintain any kind of employment. Eventually, he applied to become an infantryman for the French Foreign Legion, but was either rejected at application level or enrolled before deserting them almost immediately. The stories and records become quite blurred, as by this point in Tobin's life, he was starting to introduce himself to people under numerous different names and aliases, often giving himself somewhat of a backstory in the process. He would ultimately go on to have at least 40 different identities. That's a lot of identities. Yeah. Well, that's a lot though, isn't it? How does he stay on top of them all? Or does he just use them once and then chuck them? be very hard to yeah know who you told what to one of these different identities seemed to land in 1967 as tobin is offered a job as a trainee chef in the glasgow city center it seems that in the process of all of the previous rejections he had refined his personality and his approach his colleagues would describe him as friendly charming and outgoing but that he was also quick to anger if something wasn't going his way in the kitchen. Tobin would throw himself into his new role and work double shifts six days per week in order to save money for a place of his own. He would spend the one day a week that he had off dancing in a local club called the Barrowlands. Keen dancer. He was. Sharp looking and a keen dancer and some of the fellow chefs described him as handsome, Tom. So Tobin would often go to the Barrowlands by himself, but very occasionally he would go with a select few colleagues from work, uh, and they would recall that he would do his very best to make one drink last him the entire night while spending the rest of his money on drinks for girls he would speak with on the dance floor. Eventually, this tactic went to plan, and a 22-year-old Tobin met 17-year-old receptionist Margaret Maggie Mountney. Uh, the pair very quickly hit it off, with Maggie falling for Tobin's confidence and charm. Initially, the relationship was picture-perfect. Tobin regularly took Maggie away on long countryside rides on his motorbike to the Highlands, and he even went out of his way to introduce her to his, by now, very elderly and frail parents, uh, despite considering their relationship had been very much fractured by this point. He still was very keen to introduce Maggie to his folks. In 1969, Tobin made the decision to spend some time in the south of England, uh, and once again, it all depends on who you believe in terms of exactly why this happened. Um, so some speak of uh, basically there being a, a big work opportunity for Tobin and Maggie, whilst others put it down to Tobin falling out with Maggie's family and friends uh, and wanting to isolate her as a result of this. Others uh, believe that he wanted to relocate so quickly because he did something terrible back up in Scotland. So there's um, yeah a lot of belief for each of those three options there. 
Either way, Maggie agrees to move with him to Brighton and the pair get married the following month. It is almost immediately after the wedding that the true extent of Tobin's horrific nature would be revealed to his new wife. Wake up, Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. I ain't gonna work on Maggie's farm no more. Don't come knocking at my door. The newlyweds, having moved into a second floor flat together, very quickly fall out of favour with their neighbours. Other tenants notice that the pair would regularly argue into the early hours of the morning and that violent fuds could be heard through the walls and the floors. On more than one occasion, Tobin locked Maggie in the flat by herself whilst he went to work, and there are numerous suggestions of rape and physical violence. Maggie recalled the following. Back when we first met, I agreed to spend an evening with him at his flat. It got to 11pm and I told him I needed to go. I reached for the door and he slammed it shut. And that was me kidnapped for the next year and a bit. It's just a trigger warning here. This next section is going to talk about animal abuse as well as sexual abuse. Less than a year into their relationship, things took an even more dark and unsettling turn. During one evening, Maggie went to the local shops in order to get some bits for the couple's dinner. Meanwhile, back at the flat, Maggie's puppy, Butte, had become increasingly distressed due to not being able to see her anywhere. The puppy began howling and crying, much to the distress of Tobin. The puppy then began to continuously bark in hopes that Maggie would return, and this drew an unbelievable rage from Tobin. He went to the kitchen, returned to the living room with a large knife, and proceeded to stab and eventually decapitate the dog. Fuck off. Once Maggie returned to the flat, she was met by an incredibly disturbing scene, as Tobin and the majority of her living room was now soaked in the blood of her puppy. Instead of trying to muster any kind of apology, explanation or attempt to comfort his frozen in shock wife, Tobin simply screamed, it wouldn't stop yelping, so I threw it out of the window. Rather disturbing. I saw Maggie interviewed and talking about this uh, scenario, and apparently Maggie wouldn't be let out of the house often. That's probably why the dog was so in, in distress, looking for Maggie when she left. When she came home, she walked past a couple of boys playing football outside, and she would later on discover that they were actually kicking around the puppy's head. Despicably, Tobin then begins to sexually assault her with his knife, causing severe bleeding and preventing Maggie from ever having children in the future. Despite a concerned neighbour noticing blood dripping through the ceiling, Tobin somehow manages to convince them that it was animal blood as their puppy had been attacked by another dog. Neither Maggie nor the neighbours report any of these instances to the police, despite Maggie being hospitalised for several weeks as a result of the attack. So, um, yeah, technically these neighbours intervening and knocking at the door um, actually saved Maggie's life. Um, Tobin was in a habit of, there was some very dark sexual fantasies that he had. Um, he would regularly choke his wife as well. Um, and at this point, obviously, he's assaulted her now sexually with a knife, which was absolutely barbaric and... Yeah, she's in even in the interviews with her now, she's still kind of she seems like an incredibly strong woman, how she's able to recount recall what happened um on that evening and that she you know, she escaped with her life. She's very she considers herself still very lucky. During the early part of 1970, after not being able to find any form of steady employment, Tobin was arrested and charged with forgery and burglary after attempting to steal from his neighbours and cash in fraudulent checks. As a result of this, he was sentenced to serve five years in prison and sent back up to Scotland to be housed at HMP Barlini, uh, which is in Glasgow. Shortly after this, understandably, Maggie files for divorce and returns to her family. So from this point onwards, she would continue to keep her experiences secret. She wouldn't tell her family or close friends anything that happened other than that the, the relationship had fallen apart. Um, and she would do this because she was scared of Tobin she was scared that he would be out from prison um, in a short period of time and yeah he was released after serving just three of his five-year sentence he threatened that he would kill her and her family should she tell anything about what happened before immediately returning to Brighton Tobin did attend the Barrowlands nightclub on a handful of occasions and it is this location that provides one of the most contested links between Tobin and the Bible John murders to go back to Tobin's life shortly before his move to Brighton, in the last few years of the 1960s, a shadowy figure known as Bible John transformed this nightclub into somewhat of a macabre hunting ground, where he lurked and preyed upon unsuspecting women, ultimately claiming the lives of three victims. The name Bible John was initially coined by a taxi driver, who unsuspectedly chauffeured the killer and his final victim in 1969, recalling the chilling detail of the murderer quoting passages from the Bible during the ride. In the timeline, we'll go a bit more in depth about Bible John. In 1973, Tobin moved back to Brighton, which he would keep as a bit of a base for the next two decades. Inexplicably, he ends up married for a second time within just three weeks of his arrival, this time to 30-year-old local nurse Sylvia Jeffries. 
Pear held a small ceremony at a local registry office in the company of mostly Sylvia's family and friends. Tobin had recently taken up work as a labourer for the city's water department, digging up trenches for improved mains and sewer lines. Some would later point to the fact that his training and experience at regularly digging trenches would not only be used on this job. I found that really odd because he ha he didn't know Sylvia from his former time in Brighton and they get married after just three weeks. He, like I said before, he and it's been linked with him a lot, is, is the charm factor. And even him learning behaviours, like him saying, him learning how to cope, that's a big thing. The psychopathy test is like, you basically see how other people act and then you replicate how they act. And he's obviously very charming. He can, he's able to, you know, talk people into things. And yeah, but it's very, yeah, it's very, very quick. Um, and, you know, he obviously wouldn't have told her anything about his previous life and, you know, all the crimes he's committed and what the trouble he's been in. But yeah, it's, it's baffling. Though Tobin's second marriage did last longer than his first, it still echoed a similar noise of violence and manipulation. Sylvia fell pregnant not long after the wedding and later gave birth to a baby boy, whom they named Ian. Two years later, Sylvia gave birth to a baby girl whom they named Claire, but she sadly passed away not long after being born due to complications with her breathing. Despite now being a family man, Tobin was repeatedly and horrifically violent to Sylvia, even in front of their infant son. After almost three years of violence, Sylvia made the decision to flee from the family home together with Ian in order to live at a women's refuge, where she then filed for divorce. Sylvia claimed that over the last few months of their marriage, Tobin would demand that the pair simulated strangulation whilst having sex, and that he would become more and more aggressive each time they did it, choking her for so long that she almost fell unconscious. She started to fear for her life when he once refused to let go of her neck until their son walked in. For the next decade and a half, Tobin would roam around the country on his motorbike and would attempt once again to join different biker gangs. He would drive around the country using different names and backgrounds in order to obtain cash in hand work and accommodation. And it's believed that he was even able to take up employment in a hospital as well as a children's swimming pool. When he returned to Brighton, Tobin would take on a role as a clerk, cleaner and handyman at the Seafront Hotel. It is believed that during these years especially, Tobin would use more than 25 different names in order to obtain employment and meet new people. So yeah, this is why when we eventually get onto um, the manhunt for him, uh, it was made particularly difficult by the amount of different identities he used and also the fact that he was all over different parts of the UK at different times. Definitely. I like the idea of him keep trying to join biker gangs. They're like, nah, like, come on. And he just changes his name, walks out, gets in a different outfit and comes back in and he goes, it's me. <laughs> Ruffles the jacket up a bit. Look, look like that guy, that loser. It's me. Um, yeah, how many times is too many times to try and join a biker gang? It's a good question, Ben. Mm. Let us know in the comments below. In 1986, 10 years after his previous marriage, now age 40, Tobin met and quickly invited 16-year-old Kathy Wilson to move in with him. As is the pattern, Kathy initially found Tobin to be incredibly charming, confident, loving and friendly, but all of this would soon fall apart. Kathy fell pregnant the following year and eventually gave birth to a baby boy named Daniel in 1988, with Tobin asking his now 17-year-old girlfriend and mother of his child to marry him shortly afterwards. It's the third marriage, isn't it? You're 1987, aren't you, Dan? Fuck us. <laughs> The pair were married the following year in 1989, with Tobin entering his third marriage. A quick note to make on Kathy, her father had abandoned her when she was a baby, and her mother was a drug addict who had passed away the previous year from an overdose. She was very much on her own and without anyone's care or influence. Once again, for reasons that are not completely clear, Tobin makes the decision to very quickly uproot and relocate his family from Brighton to Bathgate, West Lothian, up in Scotland in 1990. Cathy would stay in Scotland with Tobin for eight months before secretly saving up enough money for her and her son to afford a bus fare back to England, where she eventually made her way back to Portsmouth. That's a long bus ride. She reported just like the previous two wives that Tobin was sexually violent, sadistic, manipulative and unpredictable, full of rage, psychopathic, entirely controlling and had also attempted to drug both her and her infant son. It's quite the list, isn't it? Kathy, who has now appeared in numerous newspaper and television interviews, would say the following on her husband. The thing he most enjoyed was having power and total control. He threatened to throw Daniel down the stairs if I ever left him. He was a monster. Throwing his dinner at me, putting his hand around my throat became routine. I was his slave. Even when I went into labour, he refused to take me to hospital until I cooked a roast dinner for him and some friends. I was scared to cross him and felt completely tied. I mean, that is hideous just in terms of obviously the threats, but 
has a roast dinner is a long it's a long process and for him and his some friends so they had friends around and they could see that um she'd gone into labor and they're like yeah, that's fine behavior mm-hmm. it's like step in for fuck's sake jesus Despite informing her family of why the marriage had broken down, Kathy never went to the police. And again, I, I don't know if she would reveal quite the extent of the abuse that she had suffered at his hands. Once again, she did this due to fears of what Tobin was capable of. This fear was heightened when, in 1991, Tobin was able to track her down in Portsmouth and decided to move to Kent in order to be, quote, closer to home to his son. Which still, Kent to Portsmouth is still a, a fair old trek. People are quick to point out that Tobin was not able to do this when it came to his, his second wife, Sylvia, uh, and, and their son, Ian. So perhaps this compelled Tobin to not allow the same thing to happen once again, essentially hating anything to be out of his control or power. As a result, Tobin uproots once again and moves to Margate, Kent, renting a house at number 50 Irvine Drive. It is believed that within these walls, Tobin would launch a spree of crimes that would shock and appall the country to this very day. And it is here that we move to the timeline of the case of Peter Tobin. On the 10th of February 1991, 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton had just spent the weekend at her older sister's house in Livingston. Her sister Sharon gave her a big hug as she dropped her off at the local bus stop, which then took Vicky to nearby Bathgate, where she would then get on a second bus in order to get her to her parents' home in the village of Reddin, near Falkirk. As the connecting bus was going to be a while, Vicky made the decision to go get a bag of chips from the chip shop before making her way to the next bus stop. As soon as she managed to find a chip shop, she realised that she had now become lost from the connecting bus stop, and as a result, she approached several strangers and asked them for directions. Unfortunately, it's believed that Peter Tobin, who is now in the process of relocating his belongings from his home in Bathgate to his new accommodation in Margate, was either watching Vicky approaching these strangers or just happened to spot her waiting on her own at the connecting bus stop that she eventually found. Either way, Vicky would sadly not be waiting when a connecting bus arrived, and all that was left at the scene was her dropped purse on the floor. The search for Vicky became the largest missing persons case that Scotland had ever seen to this point. It is widely accepted that Tobin, still incredibly bitter about Cathy and his son escaping from him, abducted the 15-year-old before raping, torturing and murdering her at his empty home in Bathgate, which is 1.5 miles away from the bus stop. He then cut her body in half and wrapped each half several times in bin liner. Tobin then drove Vicky's corpse in his van to his rented accommodation in Kent, where he waited until the very early hours of the following morning to bury her body in the back garden. A gruesome note to make is that, due to the fact that his Bathgate property was pretty much vacant and her body would be so decomposed by the time it eventually was discovered, it is unclear how long Tobin kept Vicky alive before murdering her. Crucially, Tobin would make two key mistakes here. He abandoned the murder weapon, a dagger, in the attic of his house in Scotland, whilst burying Vicky together with her jewellery 470 miles away at his house in England. On the 5th of August 1991, six months after seemingly getting away with the murder of Vicky Hamilton, but with very limited contact managed with his third wife and son, Tobin is still hungry for what he believes is vengeance. Tobin, after eventually being able to arrange some time to spend with his son in Portsmouth, finds himself driving around the Lippock area, uh, and this is where he happens to spot two hitchhikers, a male and a female and this pair were hitchhiking on the side of a country road looking for a lift home after attending a music festival. He picks up both of them with no clear plan in his mind, and though the pair initially found him to be a little bit odd, they were comforted by the fact that he had his son Daniel's baby seat in the back seat of the car, and that he spoke so fondly of his family life, of his wife, and of his baby son. With almost total trust in Tobin, the male hitchhiker arranges to be dropped off at Junction 8 of the M25, whilst the female hitchhiker, 18-year-old Dinah McNichol, stays in the car with him in order to be dropped off several miles further on. This was the last time that anyone saw Dinah alive, and due to Tobin spitefully keeping so much information to himself, it is unclear exactly what happens next. What is known is that Dinah was transported for an hour and a half over the 78 mile journey from Rygate to Margate. It is unclear if she was transported while still alive, but she sadly ended up buried in the back garden of number 50 Irvine Drive next to Vicky Hamilton, with Tobin disguising the buried bodies under a sand pit for his son. Over the next few months, Dinah's family would be tormented by the fact that numerous large withdrawals were made from her bank account at ATMs in Hampshire, Margate and Surrey. As these withdrawals were taken specifically from Dinah's savings account, which was something she was very vocal about telling friends and family she was saving uh, to go traveling and for university fees, um, her family became adamant that it was not Dinah making these withdrawals. More than 1,900 pounds were taken from the account before it was frozen. 
a thing to make a note on about the sand pit was I saw an interview with the neighbour who apparently saw him din digging the hole and he was the neighbour was like you're going a bit deep there and he said if you're gonna do it if you can do it right you gotta do it properly or something like that which in context is horrible yeah yeah the neighbour it's not wrong though because if you're digging a pond it needs to be deep yeah but sand pit does it need to be deep for a sand pit <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, why don't you just build a sort of ground up one with wood? Obviously mm. for, for Tobin, it wouldn't have served a purpose, but... You could still bury under the sand pit, then put the wood down. I guess they want... Probably shouldn't speculate. Yeah. yeah. If you want it to be deep for a kid to be able to sort of dig and build things. I wouldn't feel comfortable with my kid playing on top of a dead body, but I, that's me. That's me. That was it. The neighbour went, are you trying to get to... Aust-? You did the classic, are you trying to get to Australia? And Tobin went, no. No, I'm not. Can we just stop this conversation? <laughs> Got to carry on with digging. See you later. So over the next two years, the kind of the time period here for for Tobin, it, he he's pretty much unaccounted for. There are links to different murders that occur during this time, which we'll uh, we'll talk about in our aftermath. But yeah, there's not a great deal of information on record in terms of where he was working, what name he was going by, where he was living. Um, but he's believed to have been predominantly based in Margate, though still had places he could stay up in Scotland, over in Portsmouth, in between. So, but he had a lot of places in Brighton as well. So two years go by and it's not exactly clear what Tobin gets up to during this time. On the 4th of August 1993, having recently relocated from Margate to the town of Havant in Hampshire in order to be even closer to his son, it is speculated that Tobin had formed somewhat of an amicable relationship with his ex-wife, to the point that it seemed to quell his bloodlust. However, this all drastically changed during this particular afternoon. Cathy had allowed Tobin to have Daniel, now approaching his fifth birthday, over at his new flat, where the pair were watching television together. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Upon opening the front door, Tobin comes face to face with two 14 year old girls who were in search of his neighbour. As the neighbour wasn't home yet, the pair asked if they could wait inside Tobin's flat until they arrived as it was raining at the time. Tobin allows them in, where he then introduces them to his son before disappearing into the kitchen. There's just a little warning here, this next part is particularly horrific. Tobin returns to the living room armed with a kitchen knife and immediately starts making threats towards the teenage girls. He then begins to force the girls to consume cans of cider whilst also making them drink from a bottle of vodka at knife point. He tells them to be quiet and to lay on the floor whilst he attempts to bind them. He does all of this in front of his four-year-old son, explaining that the group were playing a game together. As one of the girls attempted to break free, Tobin stabbed her in the shoulder, once again in front of his son. He then moved his son into the spare room and returned to the living room, where he proceeded to sexually assault and rape the two girls. Tobin then calls his ex-wife Kathy and asks her to come and collect Daniel as he feels like he's experiencing heart palpitations as well as sharp pains in his chest. She drives to his flat where Tobin hands her Daniel at the roadside outside of the flat. He returns to the flat once the coast is clear, closes all the windows and turns on the gas stove without lighting it, hoping for both girls to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Tobin then flees to Coventry where he went into hiding by joining the Jesus Fellowship sect under yet another false name. Fortunately, both girls survived the ordeal and Tobin was eventually tracked down in Brighton after his blue Austin Metro was spotted outside another church. He was immediately arrested and sentenced to serve 14 years in prison after pleading guilty to rape, indecent assault and sodomy. Tobin would only serve 10 of these years before once again returning to Scotland. So Tobin being very manipulative here, he's obviously using his son and using um, the car seat in the car to make himself seem uh, trustworthy and harmless. And just uh, as we mentioned as well earlier, the fact that he was more than happy to to use his son as a pawn in his kind of game. He's even playing with his son in his back garden on um, the sandpit which he made, which essentially was him playing with his son on the graveyard of the women he had murdered. He'd also use his son to try and lure unknown babysitters into his flat and haven't. Yeah, that that's horrific. I know I know the son has recently done interviews or over the last few years has done some interviews as well over what he was able to recall from these events because obviously when those two friends of the next door, the, the teenage girls that were going for his next door neighbour, he was, what, four and a half, five at the time that, that he witnessed his dad essentially abduct people from, from outdoors and bring them into the flat and bind them. Yeah. That must stay with you, that memory. And, st- and stabbing one of them as well. Like... Um... Yeah, horrible. So uh, Tobin would spend the next decade behind bars and we move forward to September of 2006. Now a free man after serving 10 years in prison, Tobin, who had been living under the false alias of Pat McLaughlin, once again has police on the search for him after he left the accommodation he had been staying in as a registered sex offender. So yeah, so with this, the initial accommodation that he was staying in, uh, his registered address was in the Paisley area. Um, However, he had moved to Anderston uh, without informing the police. 
Uh, so Tobin, or Pat as he was now known, had taken up work as a handyman at St. Patrick's Church in Glasgow, uh, where he was also offered accommodation. Father Nugent, who hired Pat, considered him to be a saint as he was so quick to help with renovations and improvements at the church. He'd basically work any hour of the day. Um, he would also get involved with cooking and charity work, um, but Pat was far from a saint. 23-year-old Polish student Angelica Kluke was also working and living at the church at the same time. She was working as a part-time cleaner in order to raise money for her studies and to send home to her family back in Poland. Uh, so yeah, she had been given a room in the clergy house. So Angelica viewed this as a safe way for her to learn English whilst also getting a wage uh, and also free accommodation. But sadly, this safe haven that she, she considered herself to have found was far from the truth. Everybody, including Angelica, knew Pat as a friendly, happy and softly spoken man who could fix anything you asked him to. But beneath this new exterior, the evil of Peter Tobin would very much remain present. During the evening of the 24th of September 2006, Angelica was last seen alive within the church with Pat. What happened next is not completely clear, but it is believed that Pat convinced Angelica to go to the large garage that was attached to the clergy house with him in order to help him lift something heavy uh, that he was basically telling her he was building a large shed in the garden of the clergy um, and that he needed her help to carry parts of the panels. When he finally got her isolated and alone, the man that she knew as Pat very quickly became Peter Tobin and unleashed the most brutal of attacks on her. Tobin repeatedly bludgeoned, stabbed and raped Angelica, stabbing her a total of 16 times. Tobin then carried and placed her body within the crawl space of St. Patrick's Church via a trap door which was located near the church's confessional where she would later be found three days later with her hands bound by cable ties and her clothing soaked in blood in a state of undress. All of the forensic evidence gathered at the scene suggested that Angelica had actually been placed in the crawl space while she was still alive, which is, yeah, absolutely gruesome. Professor Lou Schlesinger said the following on the murder of Angelica. When you look at the attack and how frenzied it was, it indicates to me that this is a clear example of overkill. It is just a pouring out of this individual's anger on her, and you know that the motive was not robbery. The motive was even probably not simply sex. The amount of force used was far in excess of what would be necessary to commit the ostensible crime. He wanted to destroy her. He basically wanted to dehumanise her. A huge manhunt was immediately launched and all staff members of the church were interviewed by police. But Pat was nowhere to be found. When police searched the garage and newly constructed garden shed, they are quick to find numerous pieces of blood splatter within both locations, as well as semen or fluid which was also found on Angelica. A member of the church gives the police a photo of Pat, and the following is immediately broadcasted on national television. Police looking for a missing Polish student have released a photo of the man who was the last person to see her before her disappearance. Pat McLaughlin, who's in his late 50s, saw 23-year-old Angelica Kluck on Sunday. Debbie Murphy, a former neighbour, immediately called police upon seeing this in order to inform them that Pat McLaughlin was in fact Peter Tobin. As well as a nationwide manhunt being launched for Tobin, so too is Operation Anagram, and we'll go more in depth on that in a little while. Tobin was found just two days later after having admitted himself to a hospital in London under yet another false name, James Kelly, a pipe fitter by trade, who thought he was having a stroke. So he's given a fake name, a fake job, and a fake medical. Well, he's talking about his heart, doesn't he? That's true. Maybe he did have a little bit of a worry about it, but yeah, um, so many fake names. That's what I was thinking, like, it must have been really hard for Peter Tobin to get a mortgage because the amount of cash and hand jobs he does. Mm -hmm. A nurse who recognised him tipped him off to the police and Tobin was originally arrested. PC Alan Murray, who was sent to the hospital to make the arrest, approached Tobin and started to ask, are you? And before he could finish his sentence, Tobin sat back, Peter Tobin, I believe you have been looking for me. Just said it but exactly well, like that. Yeah, rather than being Scottish, he just a stupid voice. Um, as Tobin is interrogated, Detective Swindle and numerous other police forces in the UK share information in order to form Operation Anagram. I wouldn't trust a Detective Swindle, but um, just because of his name, but then he's actually a very well-regarded police person. The series of investigations and data sharing between forces were ultimately used by Swindle in order to piece together the many lives and crimes of Peter Tobin. The group looked at more than a thousand leads on Tobin, tracked down over 40 places where he had lived, and delved into any links that they could find with unsolved murders or missing women in those areas. Although they saw numerous links to the Bible John murders, they had nothing concrete that they could prove his involvement. Though Tobin would later boast of killing 48 people, 
Operation Anagram narrowed the list down to nine unsolved crimes and missing person cases that they believed involved Tobin. This was made complicated by the fact that Tobin had as many as 60 addresses and is thought to have used up to 40 aliases. Officers also managed to link him to 38 mobile phone SIM cards. Of those nine unsolved cases, two of them were Vicky Hamilton and Diana McNichol. The former residences of Tobin were thoroughly searched. A former house of his in Bathgate was found to contain a bloody dagger covered in fingerprints and DNA in its attic, alongside numerous pieces of jewellery. So this Bathgate property was the one that was one and a half miles away from where Vicky Hamilton was abducted. Using the Tobin life timeline that they had pieced together, they then searched his next address, which was number 50 Irvine Drive, down in Margate. Tobin's former neighbour at the address who still lived next door to the property was interviewed by police and he recalled Tobin digging an extremely large sand pit which he told him was for his son back in 1991. The garden was then thoroughly searched and excavations were started, eventually revealing two skeletal corpses of 15-year-old Vicky and 18-year-old Dinah. So as Tom mentioned earlier, the, the neighbour who still lives at the property and now he appears in multiple documentaries about this case. He takes film crews up to one of his bedrooms to film into the next door neighbour's garden, which I'm not sure. Do you need consent for that? Uh, if it's not, it's going to be in... I think it'd be yeah. fine. So yeah, he he was um, he he recalled that moment of when they searched the property. Um, he recalled that very vividly, and that they were only assuming that they would find one body, and then it was revealed uh, Dinah and Vicky were only a couple of meters apart from one another. A series of separate trials were then held over the following two and a half years, and each of them were interrupted by either Tobin being found not medically fit to stand trial, or additional bodies being found, um, which was the case with Vicky and Dinah. So he was already at trial for uh, the murder of Angelica, but then these findings in his previous address added to the charges against him. Tobin was eventually found guilty of all three murders and he received a life sentence for each of them, which he was sent to serve at HMP Edinburgh as a result. Tobin via his legal team initially declared his intent to appeal these sentences, but later dropped these appeals. And eventually, regardless of the appeals, his sentence was increased to a whole life order in 2009 when Tobin was 63 years old. In sentencing Tobin for his third murder, the judge made the following remarks. You stand convicted of the truly evil abduction and murder of a vulnerable young girl in 1991 and thereafter of attempting to defeat the ends of justice in various ways over an extended period. Yet again, you have shown yourself to be unfit to live in a decent society. It is hard for me to convey the loathing and revulsion that ordinary people will feel for what you have done. I fix the minimum period which you must spend in custody at 30 years. Had it been open to me, I would have made that period run consecutive to the 21-year custodial period that you are already serving. Between sentencing and the year 2022, Tobin experienced numerous health issues whilst in prison. In 2012, Tobin suffered numerous severe chest pains and was hospitalised as a result. This was expected to be a legitimate heart attack. On the 1st of July 2015, Tobin was attacked in his sleep by cellmate and fellow serial rapist Sean Moynihan, who was more than half of Tobin's age. Tobin was slashed in the face and throat with a razor blade, but guards were able to intervene before Moynihan could kill him. Moynihan was given an additional three years to his sentence as a result of the attack, and in February of 2016, Tobin was hospitalised after suffering a stroke, and in 2019, aged 73, he was diagnosed with cancer, quickly becoming frail as a result. Tobin would be treated for his cancer and go on to survive for the next three years before passing away on the 8th of October 2022 in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Tobin spent his final days chained to a hospital bed riddled with cancer, which there are numerous photos of, whilst continuing to deny closure to the families of potential victims, not dismissing having murdered additional victims and not confirming that he had only murdered three people. His ashes were scattered at sea eight days later after no relatives or next of kin came forward to collect his body. After he died in October 2022, detectives reacted by sealing off his cell at HMP Edinburgh and beginning to examine his personal items. These items included clothing, toiletries, jewellery and a collection of books. It's been confirmed that they'll be held in storage for up to three years, but will be destroyed if no one comes forward for them. People believe that there may be clues left behind in his books that could link him to other murders and that the items are still being investigated two years later in 2024. An anonymous source close to the prison said the following in an interview to Sunday Mail. It's tempting to say that anything belonging to Peter Tobin should be wiped off the face of the earth after what he did and the misery he caused. But Tobin has always been suspected of many more crimes than those he was convicted of, and there is always hope that something belonging to him could potentially lead to something one day. Yeah, that, and that is the case of Peter Tobin. We're going to move on to some aftermath now. 
So yeah, well, I mean, it's already been an absolutely harrowing case, but we're going to start with something particularly upsetting. On the 4th of April 2007, during the height of one of Peter Tobin's trials, former Reverend Jerry Nugent, who was 63 years old at the time, made the shocking admission um, when he was called to testify that he had actually been engaging in a sexual affair with Tobin's third victim, 23-year-old Angelica Kluke. Um, and this happened apparently just weeks before she was murdered. She was found buried under the floor of the very church that he preached at, having been murdered by Tobin, who was obviously the handyman of the church. During his testimony, he said the following. She had been staying at my chapel house for a number of months. The sexual intimacy happened about three or four times. I felt guilty and I felt ashamed and disgusted with myself. I knew it was wrong. I recently resigned and now I'm receiving therapy for my alcoholism. Yeah, he says he resigned, but I think that was very much a push for him to resign. So understandably, after this made the news, numerous other women and young girls came forward to claim that Father Nugent had either raped, molested or made inappropriate advances or comments to them. He was found dead in his home just three years later in 2010, having no apparent major health problems at the time. Uh, so it was reported in the news that he had suffered a heart attack. A spokesperson for the Catholic Church of Scotland said the following in a lengthy press release. Father Nugent is now dead. He was removed from parish ministry as soon as the extent of his totally inappropriate sexual behaviour with adults became apparent. It may be that no one will ever know the full truth of Father Nugent's wrongful conduct and criminal actions, but the church remains ready and willing to cooperate with the police to assist survivors. The church offers ongoing counselling to those affected and will also cooperate fully should they engage legal representation to seek financial recompense. I found that state the, the statement is four times longer than that particular paragraph, but I found it really weird that they had to specify adults in that first sentence there, that he was removed after the extent of his behaviour with adults became apparent. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just the reputation the church has yeah. with the younger. But yeah, I found that all just particularly horrific from uh, in terms of uh, Angelica Kluke's life. I mean, she came to the UK hoping to get some money and learn English and eventually better herself and her studies. The safest place for her might have been a church and she was surrounded by people that wanted to cause harm to her, which is, yeah, not very nice at all. Literally, the very first article I saw when we started our research for this case was, I saw the headline and I immediately clicked it. It was a bit of a misleading one from the Daily Mail, but I think it says a lot about me that I found it misleading. Uh, the headline was, Body of serial killer Peter Tobin, 76, dumped at sea after no one came forward to claim the body. And I, I took that very literally when I saw it, thinking, oh, they've just popped him in the sea. But obviously, he, his ashes were scattered at sea. So it probably says more about me, isn't it? It's not a bath bomb, Ben. No, he's not. He's not. Um, and I don't think he's good enough to be fish food um, either. Um, but yeah, this this action itself of his ashes being scattered at sea um, is considered actually quite a um, an honourable thing. Um, so lots of people that are either in the military or live life, uh, you know, in coastal towns wish for that to be the way that their ashes are scattered. And yeah, it upset a lot of people that um, Tobin was given that option or that he was allowed to have that dignity. So yeah, it, um, that particular news of him, his ashes being scattered at sea, pissed a lot of people off, particularly the members of bike chat forums, which again, maybe Tobin at some point tried to join um, alongside his you know the numerous biker gangs he um he tried to join but yeah people were saying that he should have just been flushed down the toilet popped in a septic tank um some people said that their re their own relatives had been um scattered at sea and uh, this was it was not fair that tobin would be amongst them um yeah a lot of people very very irritated by that one one thing that we did notice about this case is at the start of the episode, we like to go through different case names or nicknames that the individual or individuals have. One of them that we found was the Beast of West Lothian, um, but it was a bit of a stretch for him. The more commonly uh, referred to Beast of West Lothian is actually uh, somewhat of an urban legend believed to have been a four foot by three foot black panther uh, that apparently lives in wooded areas of the Scottish countryside. Um, so yeah, it became sort of an urban legend. Peacock Studios even made a little bit of an indie horror film on the subject. Um, so if you're interested in the Beast of West Lothian, um, you know, check the movie out. 
In 2012, a dossier revealed to the public that Tobin, who boasted in prison of killing a total of 48 women, briefly worked as a school caretaker in Sussex in the 1980s. He also frequented the towns of Turriff, Aberdeenshire and Lags Ayrshire. The dossier includes a list of 65 times that Tobin visited the children's hospitals between the ages of 23 and 60, but the only gaps remaining from the Operation Anagram in periods through his life were 1977 to 1978 and 1985 to 86. That's why I said at the start, I felt like in terms of how much he moved about, changed his name, changed um, you know his backstory, different roles, lived in different churches, hospitals, I'm surprised they were able to, with the technology they had then, cover all every year and location of his life. I thought that was a solid job. Anagram's a, a very fitting name for it as well. Yeah. I think um, Swindle was the one that I heard on the podcast where he's very much adamant that what we're about to go into, the links to Bible John, that he strongly thinks that he's not yeah. him. But you can see why, obviously, the links to him, obviously him working in churches and whatnot, you can see why people were quick to kind of put them together and him saying such a number as well. Yeah. You can see why police, or also why some people out there have, have think that that would make a lot of sense. Um, so the two key Tobin houses, the Bathgate and the Margate houses, where are they now? The Margate house is still standing and is occupied by individuals that understandably do not wish to be named or interviewed. So as we mentioned, the next one neighbour that would take the film crews up to the bedroom to kind of show them next door, the kind of bird's eye view of the sandpit where I'm um, and was to bury his victims um he went on to explain that he had to go attend two of the three trials and said that tobin would act in a very strange manner so when he saw him he would turn on the charm immediately and be hey how you doing mate how you like greeting him out as he would normally would greet him and just walking past him on the street so he found that very disconcerting and very odd that tobin would do that especially in such a circumstance at a complete contrast, the Bathgate House, meanwhile, on the Levin Robinson Avenue is still uh, standard and occupied, with its residents doing interviews and giving tours to national newspapers. So in terms of the links to Bible John and numerous other murders connected to Tobin, in prison, Tobin would regularly claim to prison psychiatrists that he had killed specifically 48 women. Operation Anagram uh, initially linked him to 90 missing people, and they then narrowed that down to nine missing people and Tobin went to the grave having only been found guilty of the three murders that we've gone through. He absolutely reveled in torturing the many families that were still searching for answers in terms of where their missing loved ones were. Um, at the time of recording, there is a list of 17 murders and disappearances that many people believe are prominent and that Tobin could have been responsible for. And these include murders that have also been linked to other serial killers, including Robert Black, Levi Belfield and Angus Sinclair. And there are, of these 17, uh, this kind of short list of 17 murders, there are kind of extensive details about the time period, the location, the MO, um, the, the victim, and they do, you can understand the links, the potential links to Tobin. But then also based on the type of man he is, you could argue either way, the power and control, he obviously, I'm inclined to believe he wanted to take that to the grave, as we said at the start, so that more people would still be speculating to date, which we, we still are. So obviously we can't go into all 17 of these um, additional links uh, to different murders and disappearances now. So I'll pop this in our Facebook group. If you just search I Could Murder a Podcast, uh, both our page and our group will pop up there. Yeah, Ben, why don't you pop that in the group? I will. Thanks, man. Perfect. Cheers. Um, the other thing to mention as well with the Bible John stuff is that it's actually proven that Tobin was getting married in Brighton at one of the times of one of the murders. So people have said that that's enough within itself to kind of convey the fact that he couldn't have been involved. And another podcast I listened to called Murder Scotland, which was a very enjoyable podcast to listen to. They, they, deep, they dig deep into the Bible John stories and then they try and figure out who it could possibly be. And there's mention of um, a story relating to a criminal as part of one of the gangs in Glasgow at the time who was going around bragging the fact that he was Bible John. And the gang themselves basically um, decided that he could bring a lot of heat onto them from the police. So they disposed of them themselves and threw him in a lock. Oh, wow. Yeah, because they didn't want the police to come after him. After them, they thought, you know, and also I'm sure that even though they're gangs, they still abided by certain rules and, you know, would have thought that that, yeah, killing women isn't um, something that's looked upon with much favour, even in that kind of world. Yeah, definitely. It would, they were very prominent unsolved murders at the time. They still are to date. People find that the whole mystery of it very fascinating. Tobin, immediately after his conviction, was very quickly linked to possibly being responsible for them. Um, and uh, he had been, although, yeah, as Tom said, he was down in Brighton to get married. He had been kind of traveling up and down. He had 
regularly attended the same nightclub at the same time that the unknown killer is believed to have been uh, attending that nightclub in search of female victims. But police, as well as uh, Operation Anagram, have conclusively ruled him out due to the location timelines not lining up, uh, disputed DNA evidence and conflicts in appearance, though there are some people that do believe adamantly that Tobin was Bible John. I don't think he was. Yeah, I've got faith in Swindle, to be honest. Um, I think it, it, not, you know, a lot of people, it, ma it makes a good, it kind of makes a good story, doesn't it, to be him and, you know, to seal it all up. But at the same time, as like even the name Bible John, I know Swindle wasn't a fan of that name, and it kind of came about with a lot of journalists kind of pushing that name and story. You know, people have done that with The Ripper. Um, it's that kind of the horror story, it really sells and gets people, you know, interested, which. I know Swindle was yeah, keen to kind of just diminish that, saying, you know, he just quoted a couple of Bible verses or that are commonly known phrases, and then he got this name from it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of the, the fake names that uh, Tobin would give out were biblical names, and he spent a lot of time in different churches, which people kind of quickly make those connections. But other than that, and the kind of, obviously, the, the time, the years that he was active, nothing else for me really stands out to, to make me think that Tobin was Bible John. Definitely, and I know it sounds silly to say, but the name John is very common around that time as well. So it's, 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 yeah. But yeah, I can see why people have linked them, but at the same time, yeah, I don't believe it to be true yeah. personally. Here are two that I do believe are much more likely to have been Tobin. Uh, and this is the cases of 22-year-old Jesse Earl and 18-year-old Louise Kay, both of whom were based in Eastbourne and both of whom disappeared during the 1980s. So yeah, many people consider these to be the fourth and fifth victims of Peter Tobin. So Tobin was believed to have been working as a handyman at the Holy Trinity Church in Eastbourne, uh, which Jesse Earl was a member of when she disappeared. She had recently been complaining to friends of a middle-aged Scottish man who had been bothering her at the time. Her skeletonized remains were found partially buried in Beachy Head in 1989, which is the very same location that Louise Kay was abducted from. Louise was abducted while she slept in her car at Beachy Head at the same time that Tobin was working at a beachfront hotel in Eastbourne. She too had mentioned to friends about a middle-aged Scottish man who had been bothering her, but who had given her money for petrol. Both Louise and the car that she was sleeping in at the time of her disappearance have never been seen since and Tobin adamantly denied both murders. But those ones, I mean, there are extensive details about both of those cases. Those ones I'm inclined to believe were more possibly committed by Tobin than any of the Bible John ones. Yeah, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because it's like the control aspect of it, and he is one that's willing to go down in infamy, like we said. But him saying, for, I've, I've killed 48 people, and then, you know, not saying who they were. If people were to correctly say which ones he did, I'm surprised that he wasn't claiming them as such. Mm. If he did do them, so I don't really know the kind of gain for him not to... I know it's the control aspect still, you could argue, but... Yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a very complex and um, horrible story, the, the Peter Tobin story. And, and yeah, sadly, there's a lot of... Um, murders I think that never will be solved because he has taken them to the grave with him yeah definitely definitely so that was the case of Peter Tobin um, we don't really have he doesn't really have a nickname does he he goes by so many bloody names that there's not a spare nickname going about so that was the case of Peter Tobin we're going to go with the anagram killer um, which we quite uh, quite like the sound of but not the theme of We'll be back next week with yet another episode. There's two episodes remaining of the series, two big, big cases um, and the big finale uh, a fortnight away from now. If you just can't wait until then, why not head over to our website, which is icmap.co.uk. At the time of recording, 151 uh, episodes over there. Um, extra uh, discount on merch if you become a member and you get everything there nice and early too if you're on the prestige level. Recently covered the Nutty Putty Cave uh, incident which was harrowing um the michael barrymore pool party death which was controversial um and uh the murder of lee rigby which was incredibly upsetting but yeah all that and so much more icmap.co.uk ben has tagged me in for this week's cryptic clue um so play the jingle Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather round for some clues that can be quite cryptic but he's gonna give them to you anyway hope you can figure them out the clue is, it's next week's episode. Dun, dun, dun. There you go. I'm not giving you any more than that. And Ben, you're not allowed to say yes, you're right, if people get it right. That's fair. That's fair. I'm just going to stay away. Please. 
please do. But yes, thank you for joining us for this week's case and thank you for voting for the audience vote. We very much do appreciate it. But we'll be back next week with a brand new case. And until then, like we um, have been known to say... We've been known to say this all the time. <laughs> keep on doing what you're doing. Oh, wow. Goodness me, unless it's... Oh. If a biker gang says no... Yeah, take the hint. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many times? Burning for his SIM cards as well. I didn't realise he's stayed with the times. Don't be overzealous. With SIM cards? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't eat Easter eggs the way that Dan does, because you're going to lose some teeth or some fingers. <laughs> um, well, we're rolling for that. Yeah, we got him. Get him, Bonds. See you later, guys. Two pip.